has come in. We can get started for today. Thank you for reposting that channel. You know, let me catch up. And yeah, Omar, you did hear souls. Yeah, that's from the paper that you posted, actually. All right, this thing is taking a moment on my side. Apologies. Yeah. The recorder is always the last to hear the ding. I already got it. Yeah, so. All right, yeah just got it. All right, so uh, welcome, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 12th, uh, and welcome to our community call. So uh, on deck for today, I'm going to talk about uh, decentralized research centers and some of the thinking around that. This is related to the presentation that I did at DSide Day a couple weeks back. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll also uh, leave some time at the end, I'm sure, regardless, for uh, just some general conversation as it's been an active week and folks might want to jump in on a, a variety of topics there. Um, so yeah, let me go ahead and share screen. All right. So I'm going to full screen this and hopefully that still works. If I don't hear anyone, I assume it does. Uh, but yeah, I'll just give a, a, I won't kind of take my time with the whole thing, but I'll go through the general presentation on thinking about uh, knowledge ecosystems through the prism of impact networks and research impact networks and what that could look like uh, across Web3 from this perspective and how that intersects at least at a high level with some activities at SCURP. So uh, in terms of uh, networks, you know, the whole idea is networks exist wherever there are uh, groups uh, coming together. Uh, and, you know, we think of that, I think, in the human context a lot of the time, but networks can be seen in more biological and technical senses uh, as well. And for anyone who's had a chance to take a look at David Ehrlichman's book, uh, Research Impact, or excuse me, Just Impact Networks, uh, it's, a, it's a great book going over this concept. And I really like this definition that he provides in the book talking about this mix of vibrant community and a healthy organization uh, that they can bring some of the relational components from community uh, and the creative components from community while adding the structured and strategic elements uh, from, uh, uh, from more organizations uh, and being able to have this sort of mix of the benefits uh, of both. And I especially appreciate this bias for action. So not just bringing people together and having a resilient organization uh, that is based on trust, but also actually having a common uh, aim, a focused operational uh, backbone and a bias for actually getting things done and moving things forward. And I think in the research side, thinking about what this bias for action really means is something that could be a topic in its own right and getting into the question of well, what do we even mean by uh, advancing Web3 research and what are the components of that uh, but uh, at least for the sake of the discussion today, I'm thinking of it as both trying to increase the amount of actual research that exists, but also very importantly, and where we more started, is thinking about how to make the existing research base accessible to those who are building and trying to operationalize relevant elements uh, and how to build tighter kind of feedback loops there. Um, so yeah, as we kind of go through this, just keep in mind that uh, impact networks, as we just heard about, are these mix of community and organization, uh, and that they can operate at different kind of effective scales. So not every network, depending on its goal, uh, will need to operate at the same size as others. Uh, and that it's important to think of how these networks can all come together in sort of a, a network of networks model. Um, and thinking about research as networks, uh, I see kind of a, a couple of different layers to it in terms of research and, and then review and publication. And on the research side, there are already a variety of different uh, networks that can, that can exist. You know, there are labs with team, uh, within universities, there's departments, uh, there's inter-university groups, uh, you know, there's uh, within companies, there's teams focused on certain topic areas and researching certain areas. And then there's industry organizations bringing together players. Uh, there's groups that are building bridges across academia and industry, and then there's also kind of independents who come up with their own ideas and add to the general knowledge base. 
And in terms of the review and publication side, uh, I really see these as kind of being combined for now that, you know, you get formal peer review, at least in most places as it's defined to be official peer review, you get that once you submit to a journal or a conference. Uh, so uh, as part of what uh, the open peer review project that we're experimenting with at SCURF is overall looking at what happens when you split apart the review from the publication and you can just provide research outputs a way to get to improve their uh, actual final products and their thinking. And so, for lack of a better term, I'm bucketing uh, these three elements together uh, as, into, uh, as the sort of intellectual networks. Uh, and the bundle of them consists, uh, the bundle of research networks and review and publication networks come together to form these kind of intellectual networks. Uh, and these are only one aspect of a larger ecosystem uh, that for me really come together when you have the, the social network layer, the, uh, excuse me, the intellectual uh, network layer, the social network layer, the financial layer, and the operational layers, uh, that these come together uh, and have a specific culture to them. Uh, and that kind of ties it all together as a single knowledge ecosystem. So just to give a little more color, again, the networks that constitute these different components, uh, we already talked about uh, the, the research and review and publication sides. And in addition to that, there's also the researcher training. So uh, in, uh, you know, in, uh, in academia, this can look like uh, hiring a PhD or a postdoc and just teaching them some of the specific methods used in a lab, uh, or when it's at a, you know, a private R&D lab, it's frequently also hiring PhDs or uh, folks who are, uh, uh, have recently been postdocs uh, and kind of showing them some specifics about the way work is actually done in, in that uh, concrete environment. So this is really kind of advanced training. On the social side, there's the general community layer. So bringing people together, I think the community layer is super important for the culture component, uh, which I'll touch on in a moment. Uh, and uh, in addition to the community layer, uh, I see an important aspect, an important network to comprise this overall social network layer is the communication networks that are relevant there. Sort of who's producing media, who's publishing information, and as a result, who's kind of trying to push forward certain specific ideals or standards in, the, in that uh, ecosystem. Um, and then there's also learning networks, right? So who's actually providing education and learning pathways, getting into uh, a variety, into getting whatever the specific domain might be. The financial networks, I think, are a bit more straightforward, right? Who are the, what are the different networks that exist within a, a vested interest in this space in some form, and in turn are uh, willing to provide funding to, uh, to the space and to different organizations in the space. I think the operational networks is an interesting one because a lot of the time uh, they really just exist within single organizations. Uh, because there's rarely a strong incentive to kind of create operations uh, to just give that away for others and create that structure and invest in the human resources to just give it away. And uh, I think we can look more towards volunteer or open source communities that create operational networks to achieve a certain goal. Uh, but a lot of the time, these aren't actually funded or, uh, you know, given activities they are not uh, generated by someone else as a public good. They're more kind of bottom up where people come together. Uh, and I think it's an interesting experiment to think about what does research operations and supporting these various networks, what does that actually look like uh, and thinking about that as a public good. Uh, and as mentioned in that kind of overall graph, the culture piece kind of cuts across all the different networks. And I think it's important to highlight because each individual network has its own culture and then culture is present uh, across networks as well. And that's where there's definitely a lot of room for uh, misalignment or alignment between the groups and can really uh, have a massive effect on uh, how things are done. Uh, so this can I is just have a question before you move on to the next please, slide? Did I miss one? Yeah. Can we move, go back a slide? Um, in the social section here, at the end, you talk about learning. So is this where the outputs of this knowledge ecosystem occur? So when you're creating reference materials or best practices or publishing things, uh, is that done through the social network sort of umbrella? 
Well, I think it just depends uh, in which kind of way, right? If it's general documentation to make sure people can operate within the network and just know what's going on, I see that more as part of the operational network. But if it's more a learning pathway of like, hey, here's how you go from not really knowing what we're doing here to the basics of governance or the basics of cryptography or security or, you know, pick a, a knowledge domain area, that's what I see as the, these kind of learning pathways for new people to end up becoming researchers uh, and getting uh, having new pathways of contributing to the knowledge ecosystem. I guess maybe that's where the, um, this is a it's a fascinating system. I really enjoy it. There's different lenses you can look at it and interpret it in different ways. And I'm thinking, I guess, how do you wh where do you find the outputs of the system? So you're trying to maximize for creation of uh, improved or open research or improved uh, advocacy or awareness or interaction with specific domain but what are the what are the outputs and like where do you track those outputs what's getting created from this this research hub right so from something like that right i think each one of these networks will have different output focus to them right research networks will focus on uh, pushing out actual concrete research papers and new ideas and things along those lines uh, the review networks will just be reviewing what's coming out of the research networks. The publication layer is more the formal, hey, here's our official channels of where we say uh, we think we have some new kind of idea or new findings. Uh, and then uh, on the social side, right, this is more, uh, say, engaging with this kind of content that comes out. So that's where I see something like the SCURF forum being at the intersection of these two, where it takes these kind of outputs that come out of research and via uh, our forum and the grants around that, you know, create a way for the community to interact with the outputs of the research communities uh, and the research networks and to actually build its own community around that side. And here, you know, the outputs are going to be more podcasts, articles, uh, videos, explainers, things along those lines. And these can be more educational outputs. So the actual learning materials and things like that. Uh, and on the ops layer, that's where this will be the actual, you know, like any project management that's needed, any outreach tracking that's needed, any uh, just like planning needed to, to bring together these different networks uh, and make sure that there's some level of cohesion and singular culture around them. Uh, the ops layer would assist with creating those parts and those outputs. I have a, yeah, I, I like the opening quote there. So uh, bias for action is. That, that speaks to me because I have a bias for pragmatism and output. So literally what is getting accomplished here. So it might be interesting to have a new a slide in the future that just speaks specifically to outputs. Like what is the final result of this ecosystem? How are people going to take actionable takeaways and benefit materially from engagement? Um, I kind of want to jump in on kind of following that um richard's question so um, like my yeah i was kind of wondering if there was going to be an output ecosystem um following this it sounds like we have a few threads of that in each of these categories and then um like maybe if we map out the knowledge ecosystem and then the output ecosystem on the same slide and kind of like actually make a visual map of that that would be really helpful um because personally like as a contributor i'm focused on the output ecosystem and how that all works together um less than the, the input because like the knowledge ecosystem kind of it seems like most of this is input right now so yeah I would, i'd be interested in um working on like a larger map of how these all connect yeah it's really cool and i i appreciate both of you bringing that up i'll definitely chat with both of you and i see chris mentioned he's already been mapping it out uh, so yeah, it would definitely be great to, to connect and follow up and, and discuss a little bit in more detail because absolutely at this point, uh, I was kind of, uh, this is just sort of the, the framework of how to think about mapping at a very high level, the different systems that need to exist uh, to the points that were just being made. This in no way actually addresses what are the actual uh, outputs that then create the momentum needed uh, to, um, to generate the mission that we're trying to accomplish, right? So more specifically, what are the actual mechanisms with which research gets advanced? And something like advancing research is not a clear cut, you know, just do ABC and you, you know, you have your guaranteed way to advance research. So I see these kinds of, this kind of network thinking as the thing that sets us up 
uh, and build the culture around it. But I, I really appreciate the points both of you are making, and I'm going to spend time uh, writing out some initial thoughts, and, uh, and we'll share that with the community to get feedback. Because I think what you're saying, going from the system to the outputs generated by the system, uh, and uh, any then sort of uh, even getting deeper into the operations of it, of how do we go about getting those outputs, and what are the steps that need to be taken, uh, are the logical kind of uh, next steps with uh, with this thinking overall. So yeah, thank you for calling that out. And so. For me, this this idea of uh, all of these different network layers coming together, and especially building out a focused network uh, to make sure that there's concrete outputs being driven that connect the dots between industry and academia. Um, this is something that uh, I'm thinking of as these decentralized research centers, because uh, then they bring together all the different existing networks uh, of people already out there doing research here. They add a dedicated research network that does more work pulling in data from industry putting in certain outputs, both on the academic side, as well as in, in a community forum, such as SCURF, um, and contributing to these other layers, and also thinking about the, the actual tech that's needed uh, and the tooling that's used across these. Um, and yeah, this is just kind of a, a, a note of, uh, on the importance of culture and the convenience of tools and, and how they get interacted with. But uh, I don't want to distract there at the moment. Um, but yeah, with, with the way I'm seeing this playing out, um, Pretty much being that there's a one of these decentralized research centers per topic area, so you can map these to the content categories of the SCURF forum, and then there's this kind of general open peer review layer across topics. You know, in certain cases there might be peer review and publication within topics as well, but building out this meta layer, open peer review, and open publication uh, that are truly open in the sense of not having. Uh, a lot of hoops to jump through to get to qualify for it. Sort of if you're part of any of these networks and you're producing research, uh, then you get to be part of these uh, kind of systems. And having a meta-level community, uh, such as a SCURF, really uh, bring together all the different pieces that are coming out of the, you know, the governance, the, uh, the security, the privacy, et cetera, hubs uh, or centers. And so uh, one specific example uh, is the Dow Research Hub, which we're working on with the Dow Research Cooperative and with Metagov, or Collective, excuse me, and Metagov. Um, here we're going to be bringing together existing networks around governance and Dow Research. And we're looking to, to actually uh, get some funding for postdocs and academic fellows at a handful of universities for the purpose of, again, taking industry from data, collaborating with various researchers, and really doing formal academic research under that. Uh, and with time, we would hope that that would support learning pathways for new researchers, but also create these opportunities of more focused operational and funding support to be provided as well. Yeah, Rich, please. Actually, I'm not sure whether I asked this question last time I saw this slide or not, so forgive me if I'm about to embarrass myself. But um, is there a governance component that's sort of baked into this? So I, when, I, when I say that you can look at this from various lenses, there's the lens of the output stuff. I like outputs. Um, I also like frameworks, and so this is a conceptual model, an intellectual or a light operational model of what a collection of activities could look like, and then that leads to outputs. Um, the question in my mind, is there some sort of standardized framework in which all these things operate? Like, here's what your governance layer looks like, here's what your, meet, your operational layer looks like, or is that sort of uh, as needed, depending on the, the community that builds itself around these things? So my hope is that it would be possible to create some general frameworks and to say, here's a rough range of things that might work and figure out over time what are the nuances where uh, things stop working. But I think especially at this point uh, where, uh, at least from my knowledge, uh, you know, in terms of SCURF activities and what we're involved in, this is the first attempt at building one. So definitely we don't have mm -hmm. standards at this point from doing this elsewhere, but I think we are going to look at relevant governance standards of uh, communities coming together and, and discussing this. I guess there could be a risk like front loading this with um, theoretical process might slow things down, might be best to learn from it. Is that the idea? Like build a couple of these things, see what works and what doesn't work, and then sort of formalize that? 
we'll at least start working on the governance one, see how the first steps go there. Uh, and even, right, just to get the basic test of is, does this look like it's helping? And obviously all the all the different groups collaborating on this are confident that it will, especially if we're able to place the, the fellows at a couple of universities and we have some interesting leads there. Um, so I think that this is a, an interesting experiment to see how creating this kind of layer that brings together all these players uh, and adds an ops layer, a funding layer, and that dedicated postdoc layer, and also some uh, community cross pollinators to make sure that there's learning and sharing happening between the groups. You know, the DAO masterclass type project that we're focusing on and, and bringing together some academics for focused learning from DAOs. I think once you bring together all these activities, um, there should be, I, I would hope to see that there is a value being garnered from one, and then we start replicating that model in different, uh, different areas. Um, Sorry, Chris, I'm going to squeeze in another question before you go. Um, so is is there going to be a slider specific chat about where SCURF fits into this generalized model? Are we, is our role to be facilitators here or do we bootstrap and then step away? Or is that something we're going to get to later? I don't want to move us too far. Yeah, I mean, uh, to some degree, uh, yes, there's elements of this here, but I also think part of this is going to be what we will have to decide over time is in my mind, uh, I'm thinking that we don't want to operationally be involved in running all these. It's more setting up, creating the infrastructure, uh, making it sustainable, and then assessing whether or not we need to keep being involved and uh, not having the goal of us being involved, more just seeing what is needed for uh, improvement in the research outputs and application of such outputs in a specific domain area and make sure we always stick to that as our North Star. And if in certain cases that means we have to get hands on, so be it. If in other cases that means, you know, we just connect with funding dollars and provide uh, some operational support here and there, so be it. Um, so yeah, I'm not looking at it as a prescriptive model as much as a general way of thinking about it, just given the amount of overall moving parts. All right, thanks. Chris. Hey, hi. Uh, yeah, great, great, great to be here and participating in this talk. Um, I really appreciate this, this like broad, like sociological decomposition of all the different layers that are involved. Um, I think a good way to think about it is that you can't, so when you want to get these communities starting, you can, so there's on one side, every scientific community is different and has its own needs and its own praxis and its own, you know, its own quirks, right? But under this side, we cannot come in and say, hey, here's, you know, do it however you want, right? So that there's a, there's a trade-off between complete liberty to self-organize and, you know, the, the, the fact that if you give too much liberty, people will be overwhelmed, right, by that. So one way to, the way we've been thinking about it, you know, from a very pragmatic input-output uh, sense is like, how about, you know, we, we give good priors, good defaults, you know, here's, here are different structures by which you can organize your um, DAO research hub, right? Here are different types of structures. There's one structure that says, you know, this is uh, here, we're, um, you know, about creating fellowship for our researchers, you know, we'll be, you know, participating and taking the value we create and using that to create fellowships, right? That's like one way of organizing these, or the, these structures. Another way is like, Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, this is like more of a service economy that we're going to run here. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be doing, you know, peer review for a service for a fee, for example, right? For like a fixed fee. And that's how we want to run it, right? And there's perhaps, you know, a, a, a good way to, to find the, the balance between too much liberty and not enough structure and too much rigidity that doesn't really fit these communities is that the midpoint is like coming up with a few archetypes of organizations that they can deploy and run in their local gateways so that they have workflows and frameworks and organization layers that uh, are pre-deployed. And one way I like to think about it is like, okay, we have to make these, these bonfires of knowledge essentially, right? We have to get people to start uh, to, to we, we have to like create a, a, an environment for this to happen. So how do we do it? Well, um, you know, the fuel, uh, the fire, all of this is important, but you also need like a, a, a good structure, a good receptacle to create that, right? So I, I think about it, it's like, so one of the important role we have to play in that is like, here's a receptacle, you know, for you to make your fire and for you to go pursue knowledge, right? And this is the input and these are the outputs, right? And this is what we're gonna be watching for. 
but here's the receptacle. And by the way, we have different models. You know, this is one model, this is another model, that's a third model. And you know what? If you want your fourth model, the code's open source, go, you know, set it up yourself, but it's going to take more time. It's going to be harder, right? So we're not going to be solving your UX pains if you, if you want to go with something special because we just don't have the bandwidth for that. But we're going to provide you with these archetypes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, at some point in the future, we I know we're chatting with Eric and figuring out a date when to have the, the DSI Labs crew come present uh, on some of their work, because I think it, it, it's also relevant because they're building some architecture to address some of the things that Chris is just mentioning. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a, a lot of questions still here. And, you know, I, I I think a lot about what you were just saying, but from the perspective of culture and how do you build that cohesive culture to make people want to collaborate and put in the time? Because at the end of the day, all of this takes time and energy and contributing anywhere else, uh, whether or not you're incentivized takes time and energy. So uh, what is the full incentive there? And if it's just purely financial, I don't think that would be enough. Um, so yeah, 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 we need social. We need like you know, uh, like a, a like a create like cores of uh, motivated contributors that come together, that appreciate each other, and that create a culture, right? And I think that's really hard. That part of having like the core intrinsically focused group to to bootstrap a culture and to attract more people in these networks. That's going to be one of the main main challenges. And I think one of the approach we've had here, which is like talking to the Metagov people, you know, extending all around the space, is a really good one because those are all communities that are looking for, for systems, you know, that are looking for these, these uh, infrastructures and the possibility to do that, that you could, you know, have already pre-existing network structures, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and yeah, I guess I wanted to also just tie this back to uh, the question earlier on sort of where does SCURF fit into all this and what does it mean? Because, you know, we've been uh, obviously building our own kind of architecture with where to have conversation and some elements of community and operations and funding. Um, and our focus is and will continue to be in the Web3 research domain. That part is definitely not changing. But I think that we can be slightly more nuanced and kind of splitting apart and thinking, what are we trying to do across all Web3 research domains versus what are we trying to do within a single domain? Uh, and I think that nuance helps us because then we realize when it makes more sense to go uh, narrow but deep, uh, when to go across and when to think of how to connect the dots across those two. Because I think that uh, a lot of value uh, can be given to researchers and especially providing them a space for that interdisciplinary exploration, which can be challenging within their own departments. Um, yeah, Rich, I think you got your hand up first and then Lex. It feels like there's a scoping problem to play here too. So figuring out what the intention of this, this group of researchers oh. is, are they planning to fight off a particular challenge within privacy or are they want to create an umbrella for all DAO activities. Um, some of these are long-term operational tasks. Some of them are quick hit um, specific output tasks. Um, and so one hub might want to think about sustainability and how to spin off in the future and how to govern treasuries and stuff. And the other one might just want to figure out how do we produce an output in a way that's likely to succeed. I think there's an interesting scope or a scale here. Yeah, absolutely. Lex, did you want to jump in? Yeah. How are you deciding uh, what the project managers are working on? Um, that is a great question. Uh, so initially, it's just scoping out the basic things that need to happen for these networks to start coming together. So that's a mixture of, well, who are the relevant players in academia and industry? Um, you know. For this kind of thing, it's also like funding to get those postdoc fellows because that's an important bit. Um, and yeah, it's just initially kind of planning out the uh, the task landscape and how the the group of uh, collaborators. So for the Dow Research Hub, how Metagov, Dow Research Collective, and Scurf are collaborating and coordinating. Uh, mm -hmm. But from there, I think there's going to be a lot of actual further scoping out that um, it's a good question and goes back to the governance point of like how much of this is driven by, you know, a few people who are effectively the project leads versus uh, are there points to open up any of that decision making and, uh, you know, bring in the inevitable complexity that comes with that. Got it. Um, and then follow up question. So I just thinking about kind of like the um, like end UX sort of thing. Um, so it sounds like you guys have a lot of good methods for getting the research in the door 
um, and probably organizing it. And then, um, so kind of uh, where in this roadmap are you looking at kind of how people digest the research? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question because I think there's a number of components to that, right? There's the, uh, you know, between the forum, between our Discord, you know, do we need any other points of interaction to maximize the amount of uh, digestibility of research coming out? Uh, we were actually having a call earlier today of what are the right kind of uh, maybe podcast episodes to, to start helping out with certain summaries that are coming out, what's the best link there, or, or the various ways that we can add to that. But I think beyond just thinking of it in the pure content form, I think there's also the the social um, and communal components of it of, you know, what are the discussions around it? Uh, and that comes back to some things we talked about on the community side or, you know, do we want to have reading groups and, and focus kind of breakout sessions to help digest certain things and uh, at least build more conversation and excitement around certain topics. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the, yeah, it, it, it would be great to get more UX focus yeah. on this problem overall, because I think a lot of it is very much on uh, the system and feedback loop side and not really focused on the packaging and presentation side. And right. even right, like if you look at your average academic papers presentation, uh, it's very stuffy. And if you look at the groups innovating on that, they're just breaking the journal part. They're not necessarily focusing on the UX design side of things. So right. I think there's a, that is a, a very important space and one that uh, cool. will be, will get, uh, as soon as it becomes more of a focus, we'll end up having a tremendous amount of cool innovation. Um, yeah, without even like getting ahead of ourselves with like uh, fun things like AR and how that can factor in yeah. all this. But, you know, even just with our screens and whatnot at, at hand, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, I'd like to encourage you to think about some of that UX research um, at this point, even on the experimentation roadmap, because um, I'm curious, right, who are your, who are the intended people who are going to the forum and the discord um, and what, you know, what problems or challenges are they taking away from it and then what are they doing with it? I think that that will guide a lot of these other ops and information and community decisions. Um, and so, you know, you want to bring those out early on instead of finding out later on that, you know, you did a bunch of work on something and didn't need it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you calling that out. Umar, did you want to jump in? Hey, I just want to make sure I'm uh, understanding right the uh, presentation. Um, and it, it feels like there's like, um, it, it comes down to like forming social networks or social groups and giving them some infrastructure to collaborate with, whether that's like uh, Discord, Forum, GitHub. And I'm like wondering, I guess, like as you, as, as, as these social groups are brought together around specific research areas, um, what is the intent in terms of like scaling them? Like, what do we want these social networks or these groups to accomplish? Um, this is just like research output and also, um, what does scurf get out of creating these groups actually i want to steal your thunders to... for a second there eugene no, i want to answer the first question here and then i'll let you you have better insight into the second part so um if it's important when we're looking at this slide deck uh to also keep in mind what is the reason that scurf exists um we're here because we want to connect industry and academia together we want to accelerate the development of web3 by connecting um, the people that have the solutions to problems are the people that are um, trying to solve these problems. So how do we solve, I'm going to throw a bunch of pull quotes at people. So how do we solve the last mile problem? So people are publishing things. And then what happens traditionally is they go and they publish something else and then they go and publish something else. We want to solve that last mile where we get that published materials in front of people that want to engage with them, want to do dives into them, want to understand them more clearly and want to implement them. Um, how does SCURF do that? We do that by a generalized notion of facilitating the ecosystem. So we're not here to provide uh, the truth or answers or solve problems. We're here to find people that are solving problems and connect people them with people that have, that have those problems. Um, and as we evolve and become more sophisticated, it becomes clear that our role is to create, um, uh, connect funding resources and connect frameworks and connect uh operational support in venues and platforms and communication all of these 
uh, second order um, operational uh, tooling to individuals that are focused on ideas and problems. That's that's the thing that we see that are missing. Um, with uh, uh, an academic in university that, that has written a paper, does not have uh, an engine of uh, facilitation and coordination at their disposal. And we want, we want to be that agnostic and generalized engine. So that's, SCRF does that by having grants programs and having projects managers and having conferences and having panels and having publishing pipelines and having researchers on staff. We have all of these, these components and we are experimenting with ways in which we can put all these, these primitives together in a way that maximizes our benefit to the space or to Web3 as much as possible. Um, that's, that's a whirlwind tour of what SCRF is all about as of uh may 2022 um what eugene is, is is presenting to us here in my mind is a very uh pleasing way to clarify and uh, package and conceptualize the core reason for scurf existing in a way that provides clear utility to sophisticated actors or groups of actors in the space so we have all these things we have these coordination mechanisms these these rolodexes of connections uh relationships legitimacy all this kind of stuff how do we uh, find actors in the DAO space that are all operating independently when we think that hey there's some coordination we can offer here and here's some op uh, resources and some tooling and some uh, frameworks um doing that from scratch every single time is a lift so if we can package these things in a way that people understand, um, that provides us with a tremendous uh, mental model or a, a way to conceptualize what it is we do and get people excited about that. Um, and if we do it effectively and it ends up working and we learn some things like Christopher was talking about how um, we provide enough clarity in the, the chaos and the fire hose and the fires and, and the other analogies that he was using. And we allow people to actually get some work done we can experiment and say, okay, well, these things work, those things work, and then let's let's mix and match uh, some frameworks that, okay, if you guys wanna accomplish this, then it's a hub level one or it's a hub level four because you guys wanna uh, change the world. And that opens up the door to do something that I think is fantastically exciting, but uh, future plans, but uh, we can position groups of actors in the space as opposed to SCURF just simply facilitating what it is they wanna do now we can consider sort of a bootstrapping model. So, hey, you know what? Here's our frameworks, here's the funding, here's the connections, here's all the lessons and, and best practices we can bestow. Here's our uh, project, to speak to your question, Lex, is like, here's our project management and leadership uh, mentorship and resources we've offered. Um, now your organization is mature enough to, uh it, the bootstrapping phase is over so you can go out and you know, spin yourself up and go and do something wonderful in the world and then we can repeat that process where scurf sort of becomes an intellectual incubator and i know that i'm getting manifesto right now and i generally um caution people away from getting manifesto -y, but uh there, there's some interesting uh potentials here um so if we keep our eye on uh, bias for action and operationalizing and, and understanding what outputs are while we're doing that, we can have an eye to how uh, we're incubating the space a bit and providing these operational insights that we're focused on for organizations that are not focused on operations. So yeah, and I, I also just, I turned that into a speech. It's back to you. And I also just want to stress the idea of like the, the point is not for us to say, hey, this is our view of the networks that need to exist. Now we must go build all such networks. Uh, I think, at least in my mind, though, why the impact network. Uh, or the network framework or, or way of thinking about it really makes sense is that networks are the way people are naturally organizing, right? So it, it's not up to us to go necessarily create from scratch. It's up to us to understand what are the constituent networks within governance, within cryptography, within each topic? Who are the people that are actually driving this forward, doing the research, doing the cool work, uh, and really advancing this? 
And uh, based on that, we can then understand, well, what's actually missing? Is funding support needed? Do they not have a list of open problems that are commonly known amongst all researchers? Or do they need more learning pathways or ways of communicating it or different review structures uh, or uh, an additional layer of research that brings together a lot of the disparate data and the disparate networks? And you know, what actual support is needed, I think, will be very dependent on the, the desired domain of impact. But at the end of the day, uh, understanding what are the networks that exist, what are they trying to accomplish, where does that fit into this single topic of, you know, pick a research domain area, then mapping that you can start understanding, well, if our goal is just to help, you know, cryptography advance and we see all these players uh, focusing on different things, then we can understand what's actually missing in that. Uh, and I think in general, bootstrapping and kicking off these kind of operational layers uh, is probably going to be common in a lot of these to say like, hey, there's 30 networks playing in the same space. What if we put in the operational resources to help y'all align a little bit and help cross pollinate some of the information and help tell stories about it and help get some collective funding about it? And does that give them more time to research and a reason to be part of this bigger culture and community? Um, but yeah, Lex, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, so I'd be curious to hear in like 20 words or less, what's the number one problem that SCURF is trying to solve? Uh, in terms of mission overall, well, I guess I, I can answer that both in terms of where we started and mission overall. Um, I mean, mission overall is just uh, the shortest version is advancing Web3 research. The problem specifically is the fact that there is a lot of time is spent exploring not the most efficient problem spaces, if that makes sense, or the, the time and attention isn't always dedicated to the areas where they will have the greatest impact. And knowing that ahead of time is a tough thing to know. So we're hoping to create some of the feedback loops to, at least the way I view it, is to kind of direct where that attention should be spent, which problems to focus on. Uh, and we started by specifically trying to solve uh, information availability or of the amount of research produced, how do we make sure that as much as possible is getting to the people who need to know it? Um, okay. So, so maybe the problem statement would be like, like web three, you know, developers or contributors are having difficulty kind of identifying where they can make the highest impact or like, which like research relevant to their specific interest. I think in general, you know, Web3 just has a public goods problem, right? It has a public good problem and it's, it struggles to, uh, uh, to, to basically create the, the right, you know, nurturing environment frameworks and incentives to produce the high quality public goods that we need, like, you know, advances in ZK SNARKs, like uh, this paper that just came out, you know, Vitalik was a co-author about soul bound uh, NFTs for DAOs, super important paper, right? Finally, there's like something so people can think outside of coin board and governance, right? Which gives people much more uh, uh, creative leeway. These are like foundational things, right? And these foundational things are suffering from a coordination problem, right? So the way I see it is like one of the biggest value things that these, these crypto networks can do, highest value, is basically provide this, this infrastructure and these mechanisms so that we can produce more of these things that end up helping the whole space grow in general. Okay. So yeah. a, a problem of collection of like the highest value research for people who want to actively work on not, three projects. Not well, just can, collection, like production, you know, there's, I think there's so much. Nice. Okay. I can throw out some full quotes. And so um, SCURF is ultimately an experiment where we're trying to figure out how to do this. We want to connect industry and academia together. We want to be the connective operational support layer that mm -hmm. um, takes information out of papers and puts it in front of people that can um, implement those things. And so um, we're solving for challenges of reinvention of wheels that happen a lot in our space. Um, we're trying to keep people up to speed as quickly as possible. Um, frequently, the ch space changes so quickly that even people that are eat, breathe, and sleep uh, crypto yeah. don't really know what's going on all around them, let alone what happened six months ago. So if you're somebody spinning up a DAO, are they going to start with a Discord channel and then figure it out as they go? Um, we're past that in 2022. So there, there's, there's learning out there. There's best practices. And so how do we create 
generalized awareness, discoverability about solutions that have already been um, carved out? How do we dig out solutions that have been understood uh, for the last 400 years in academic textbooks and stuff and bring those to the table as well? And how do we, uh, the corollary here is how do we dig challenges out of the Web3 space and get those challenges in front of academics and get those data sets in front of academics and get the raw research materials that they need to provide insights back into for, uh, Web3. So a reciprocal relationship between uh, the doers and the thinkers is mm. distilled okay. down to its very core. But the, the, as we've experimented, we found that the, the greatest value that we can bring is that we're the is that operational layer because this is the thing that's missing. A mature organization has a team of project managers or product owners and is thinking about UX and has content, content copywriters and has platforms and media outlets and social uh, strategies and things. Uh, it takes a year or two at, at best to get there. Uh, having every academic collective or uh, working group spin up all of these things from scratch over and over and over again um, is an enormous challenge and it's a blocker. And if SCURF can operationalize all of these things and then offer them as a part of the common goods, or the common, back to the commons as Christopher is talking about, um, mm -hmm. this is a thing that connects all those groups together and we, we can move things a lot faster than they would otherwise. Okay. I'm having trouble kind of finding one guiding light that SCURF is trying to solve long-term either in the mission statement or the uh, slide deck. Sure. Yeah, well, it's, we're operating in, a, in an opportunity and information rich environment. And part of our challenge and part of our mandate is to remain reactive and flexible to the needs of the ecosystem. So um, we're never gonna have a simple uh, one sentence uh, uh, roadmap. It changes, uh, but if we had to, if you put my feet to the fire, we're connecting industry and academia together. That's what we're doing. And we're making the space better. There you go, two sentences. I guess another way of maybe framing it and the way I've been thinking about it more is that we are running the collection of experiments to get to more clearly articulate the answer to that question. And that there's just the, the, the total surface area of potential problems to solve is so large and unclear mm -hmm. that we feel as though we need to get closer to a few different aspects of the information side, the community side, the knowledge transfer side, the frameworks of how do you actualize research side. And like, we don't know where we can be most impactful yet. Right. And we're also struggling with, you know, er, there's always the challenge of if you go too narrow on a mission, do you effectively limit you what you're looking to do, especially in a highly uncertain space and where yeah. We were we were get, we were created with a, a mission to solve a very vague problem of make research better. Uh, so, uh, given that, I think it's a richest point. We're uh, we're not in a rush to over crystallize it to avoid the scenario where uh, yeah we we miss where the actual greatest room for impact would be. Gotcha. Um, okay, so then it sounds like. It sounds like this is all a methodology to figure out what the greatest impact will be. I, get, I, I think that's one uh, one reason sure. why we're putting it. But... We're closer to the action, though. So our this this bias for action. So we're we are allocating grants. We are supporting researchers. We are publishing research. We're we're doing these things, and we are uh, doing more of the wins and, and less of the fails. So um, it, it we're. Um, very action focused and so uh one of the things that i find so compelling about eugene's model here is that it's not theoretical it's it's a an encapsulation and a crystallization and uh, more formalizing the things that we have been doing successfully for the last year and a half mm -hmm. and packaging it in a way that is easier for us to talk about and easier for um stakeholders to um understand and participate with got it I was going to say, I know one thing that's different about SCURF is that because of the way it's funded, it does not have the same sort of external pressures or external uh, guideposts that a, a normal startup does. And as it has funding to be more of an experiment, it has the capacity to be more reactive rather than single-minded as an organization. And I think that has allowed SCURF to sort of 
evolve in a way that worked with the market rather than trying to say we have this single goal and we're going down it. Um, and that's kind of scurf does not have the same sort of pressures that a lot that you'll see with a lot of uh startups even even research hubs or not that not that specific one but research uh or or think tank type organizations many of them have a specific goal that they have to reach and then they have pressure to get there by a certain point whereas it doesn't feel like scurf has that same sort of pressure mandate and that's kind of where it, it does feel like we're not floating without a mandate, but there's not as much external pressure to be like, hey, get this done by this date as an organization. And I think that's one of the reasons Scurf, uh, it feels different than a lot of other places. Yeah. Um, so then how how are you guys measuring kind of like not not metrics, but like how are you guys measuring kind of success in finding that like big impact area? Yeah, I think, think, yeah, opinions about this. yeah, I think for now, uh, it's similarly trying to have a balance between, you know, being narrow on metrics, but also not just being ignorant of uh, our activities or just blindly doing things without having a way of assessing it. Mm -hmm. So I think for now, it's kind of direct feedback uh, from some folks who are working with both in terms of people who produce actual research outputs, people who are building organizations uh, and better understanding their problems, uh, where what we're doing fits into that landscape, how we can better do that. Uh, and I know one big one for me is just seeing, you know, are, does it seem like we're on a, a continuous positive momentum trend in that regard where we're getting more people want to talk to us about the things that we're doing uh, and better understand how to plug into it and how we can work together to, uh, you know, connect those dots between research outputs and concrete problems with things that people are building and uh, how to reinforce some of that knowledge transfer and build whatever uh, environment around that that we have to. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's also something that's uh, that we constantly have different ways of looking at and we don't we haven't come up with sort of the singular here is just what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think it goes back to what was just being discussed and given the inherent uh, uncertainty or the the inherent uh, amorphous nature of the, the problem that we're going after. Um, yeah, we're similarly needing to be a bit flexible with how we assess it. But yeah, I'd be interested in, I don't know if Richie wanted to jump in on and add to that one. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I got too much clarity and the clarity that I do want to add will not squeeze into four minutes, but um, there's, uh, we, we have a mountain of, of wins behind us. And so what I'm interested in are notable wins. And so uh, we're experimenting, we have a vibrant ecosystem of actors that are um, trading or, or carving new paths in the world. And so there's experimentation, there's enthusiasm, there's brand new ways of doing governance and uh, ways of it's conceptualizing value. And so this this is a crazy space. Um, so saying that we have a metric, uh, here's our rubric or algorithm to measure success in this space uh, is a non-starter as far as I'm concerned. So what I'm interested in are notable wins and where those notable wins come from are occasionally organic, but they they involve experimentation and reacting to new trends and supporting things as they arise. Six months ago, very few of us knew what or had ever heard of anything called DSI before. And so if we had a mandate in five core pillars of our institution that were unshakable uh, six, uh, nine months ago, we'd miss out on DSA. So uh, we're, we're shifting gears because the cultural trends in the space have moved. And so uh, we look for uh, ways that we can provide the most value and uh, we capitalize on those immediately. And so uh, I don't want to be bound by uh, 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 a, a doctrine or a document somewhere that says we do this or do that. So it's, it's a tough question. It sounds wishy-washy and it seems like it might be overly forgiving as far as uh, intention of an org goes, but the amount of, uh, of velocity and the amount of activity and, and concrete outputs and wins that we've accumulated in the last month or year and a half leads me to believe that we're probably on the right path. So it's, it's going to be hard to nail us down. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you we, we said, Richard, that the, the whole goal here is to get some significant wins, right? Well, we'll mm -hmm. figure out the rest later, but just getting to some wins that are substantial, that make an impact, I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, I think it's about just... 
it's just an interesting thing to even think about, right? What does a, a significant win around advancing a knowledge base mean and look like? And how do you know when you got it and getting there and until you finally see it and realize, especially in retrospect, the impact? Um, and this touches on so many fun questions uh, just in terms of, yeah, I mean, like, how do you fund knowledge? How do you support knowledge and disseminate it? And what are the right ways to, you know, like the groups that are thinking of retroactive funding and all the, the fun elements that might tie into that? Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate the the discussion that came up today uh, and the, all the feedback that folks gave. Please do feel free to always reach out and give other feedback to this. As I'm sure you can tell, this is still at its very early stages of being pieced together. And yeah, like the I, I've just been thinking this whole time since y'all have mentioned the output side and how to factor that in there. And the, I'm really excited to work on that a little bit. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, again, just uh, if you all ever have any questions about SCURF or any of our activities, feel free to reach out to any of our core team members, hop in our Discord. Uh, and yeah, always feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, have a lovely rest of your Thursday wherever you are in the world. Be well, Thanks yeah. for the presentation. Good night. Thank you, Gene. Thank you. Bye, Chris. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Tell Alex I say hello, by the way. I watched my appointment.